Welcome in to the Line Enquirer podcast. I'm Jeremy Warner. He's Joey Wagner, and we are talking a week after a win over Wisconsin. We're talking about a win over Iowa. Uh, gritty, if you want to call it ugly, that's fine. Nine to six, Illinois defeats Iowa. No touchdowns scored in this game. The first time an Illini game has had no touchdowns since a 3-3 tie to end the 1995 season finale against Wisconsin. Uh, I was too young to remember that one, Joy, but a lot of people remember it, I guess, uh, because it kept Illinois, I believe, out of a bowl game. But the first time in a season that Illinois has beaten Wisconsin and Iowa in the same season, you found that stat after the game. No matter how it's done, Joey, uh, it's impressive. But I think the way this one happened, the turnovers they had, your quarterback going out, starting corner, a starting linebacker, a starting wide receiver, Isaiah Williams fumbling three times, losing twice, to come out of this with a victory, I think says a lot about this team. Illinois has lost this game a lot of times. <laughs> I mean, like a lot. They did. They lost this game earlier this season in Bloomington, Indiana. And you just kept thinking, like, what? It, it, it felt – I don't want to feel like a turning point, but it did feel like you're like, which direction is this going to go? Is this going to be the same team that did this against Indiana? Or are they going to figure out – how to get out of here with a win as ugly as it may be. Yep. And they figured out how to get out of there with a win as ugly as it was with a freaking walk on red shirt, freshman kicker yep. who found out before kickoff that he was going to be kicking these games. That was a, that was a big win, man. That was a really, that felt like that win embodied kind of Brett Beal. Like, I don't yeah. care how this happens. Let's just get the heck out of here with a win. It was an Iowa kind of win. Let's be honest with you. Like Iowa's won some really ugly games where, where they found a way to force turnovers, and it felt like they were going to today. I mean, the pit in everybody's stomach in this stadium that wasn't wearing black and gold when Art Sikowski fumbled and Iowa recovers, that would have been the most Iowa win ever, and it's a credit to them of how they win these games. Uh, but I'll give Brett Bielham of this. I mean, he's a fantastic coach and mentally preparing his team. They did a great job last week about not making about them, about telling his team, like, we are good enough to win. We expect to win going in there. You're a better team. This week, he said, you're going to look up at the scoreboard in the third quarter, and it's going to be ugly. Like The last Iowa games all season, I mean, we're talking with David Eichel, who covers the Hawkeyes. It is ugly every game. So he said, don't don't get beaten down when it's you know 9 to 9 or something like that. Well, it was 6 to 6. Uh, and Illinois, man, offensively, we'll get into that. The, the red zone is a, was a real issue tonight with play calling, with execution. But the defense, who Brett Bielman now calls the fire department because they put out fires. God, he's really good at that. He's really good at the nicknames. <laughs> Even Johnny Mitchell. Be a tougher one to NIL, though. <laughs> yeah, well, there used to be a place called Firehouse here. But any, anything that's associated with that, uh, I, I drank a few beers at Firehouse back in the day on, on campus. But, <laughs> yes. I was kidding as you. I did. A good chicken wrap as well uh, from what I knew. But, yes, like that defense is elite. I know Iowa's offense is atrocious. And, boy, they they – did not impress me whatsoever, but stop after stop from them. And you said it, man, like Art Sikowski wasn't really a hero today, but he comes in, has to play a role. Fabrizio Pintone has to come in to play a role. Terrell Jennings has to come in to play a role. Kanena Odaluga uh, has a big sack late in the game. Uh, and then the rest of your defense, which has been dominant all year, the defensive front is, is just ridiculous at this point. Find a way to win that game. Like this feels huge. Like even though – it wasn't pretty. It wasn't a Wisconsin like dominance, Joey. These are the wins that really turn a program, and 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 the guys in the program know this. Like Brett Bielema knows it. You're five and one going to the back half of the schedule with a chance to really win the Big Ten West. Don't know if they will. Purdue's in the mix. Minnesota's in the mix. I know Nebraska's tied atop now, but you have that chance because you win an ugly game like this. Uh, and this is what Iowa's done all those years. It's what Wisconsin's done all these years. All of a sudden, Illinois started to win those games. Yeah, it's a big <laughs> they're not losing ugly. Like, we've seen this team lose ugly both in the score and in the kind of the gut-wrenching fashion. But yeah, it was really all over, right? And like, and Isaiah Williams missed the second half, a good portion of that. He had a really tough first half, and that was I mean, that gave Wisconsin some chance, or I'm sorry, Iowa some chance, and they still had three points out of it. Like, the, the defense... We talk about it a lot. We should. It, it makes sense. But it really like to see it deliver, like you would think, right? Watching it, you thought one of those back to the wall moments, whether they're at the five, the 18, you're like, at some point this has got to break, right? You're, this is two big 10 teams. At yeah. some point, this has got to break. Now, Iowa's offensive ineptitude uh, helped a lot with that. But dude, this defense is playing really well at, at all three levels. You, you'll see what's going on with the injuries in terms of Taz. Uh, and I think Brett Bielman mentioned Isaac Darkangelo uh, yeah. at one point. But, man, this 
to deliver like that. They still haven't given up a touchdown here, Jeremy. Four games, they have not given up a touchdown at home. And listen, I know the competition hasn't been great, um, but Wyoming is good enough to score. Iowa, Especially I don't think it's time, right? Like in garbage yeah, yeah. time, you would think, and it almost happened against Virginia. It right. did not, but that's a pretty wild. Well, and Virginia's quarters. offense, d- despite their issues this year, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with the coaching change, but that's a talented offense. You didn't give up a touchdown. Like no matter what teams you're playing at the FBS level to not give up a touchdown at home is ridiculous. So yes, the fire department is cooking right now. It's, it's pretty ridiculous uh, what they've been able to do. Um, let's get a little bit into it. Tommy DeVito, not sure the extent of the injury. We were watching him closely as he came off the field. He was talking last week about how he had an injury Brett Bielma said he re-aggravated an ankle. So this must have been an existing injury. Uh, didn't feel so good for him. And uh, you see the value of Tommy DeVito immediately. Um, you know, Tommy gets 80% of the reps, Brett Bielma says, a quarterback. But but I think we can just see a difference in the way the game is called. We've seen Art Sikowski for a year now. Um, I'm not going to give up on him that he can't help Illinois win a game. And he partly did today. But Losing Tommy DeVito shows you how valuable he is to this passing attack because Illinois passing attack was was atrocious tonight. The good thing is you can count on Chase Brown. 31 carries, 146 yards. This offensive line, I thought, did a really, really good job tonight. Brian Hightower had some really nice plays. I uh, had a great throw to Brian Hightower in the fourth quarter that set up that field goal. I mean, that And was, Jonah Morris. He had to make those throws. That's, I mean, it wasn't pretty. I'm not going to try to sit here and say, well, those two throws made up for everything. But those were – I mean, you don't – I don't know that you win. Like you, you, those throws got you down in field goal range, and and they capitalized. Those were huge, huge throws. Yeah, I mean, what we love about this live podcast is we're going to have some interaction from you guys. We love that. So so type in whatever you want us to talk about. Any comments you have? I did enjoy the RIP house. RIP Clyes uh, no longer on campus. Joey doesn't know what I'm talking about, but everyone who went to Illinois knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so a little inside baseball there, but we got to bring it up. Barry Loney had a rough game. I think Barry Loney's good. I, I really do think he's a good offensive coordinator. I think he's the better offensive coordinator on the field tonight. Um, that's a low bar because I, I don't think Iowa, what they got going with the Ferentz family, is going very well. Um, so, Joey, they get in the red zone. You have a few opportunities. I'm not angry that Illinois struggled against Iowa's offense at times, especially with Art Sikowski in the game. But when you got in the red zone like that, you're down to the three-yard line. One, because Chase Brown had a good carry to get you there. This is a field goal game. If you have to settle for a field goal, that's okay because your defense is playing well. Iowa's offense is not very good. So to roll out, Art did not execute well. Okay, Art needs to throw that ball away, live to play another day. Brett Bielma said as much post game. Yes. If, if we can't get it, they can't get it was, a, was his quote on that. So that was a mistake by Art Sikowski. But if I am Barry Loney, and we saw the way he was calling plays, like he did not trust his quarterback in there to, to make these kind of plays that Tommy DeVito did. I'm letting two carry the ball a couple more times. If you get to the one, let Art push, right, and and, and find a way to that way. I just want the ball in, in two's hands. And then the same thing on that fourth down. It looked like a disaster of a play from the start. Two wasn't even in the backfield. Art standing by himself, looking to the sidelines three times, looked unsure. And Art's trying to make a play. He's trying to help his team win a game. Um, man, that could have been disastrous if his arm did not get down. So good job by the refs in, in reviewing that. But – I didn't like that. I, I just didn't like in the moment what those plays were. Uh, give the ball to two. I think Barry Lenny will learn from it. Some people saying he lost me. I, I think that's a little ridiculous given the improvement you've seen in your offense, which I wrote about all today. Uh, I just thought he had a tough day against the defense. I think he was kind of in his head about what he could do. He wasn't comfortable when Tommy DeVito wasn't his quarterback. Yeah, I, if Barry lost you, I slow down a little bit. It, there, was some, there was a lot that we're, we're going to have to ask him about. Yes, I, I thought the fourth down, the, the fumble that wasn't, that was the most egregious of them all. Just give it to Chase Brown. Take a knee, right? Like, you're in field goal range. Just get wherever you need to go and get down. I had – when Chase Brown motioned out of the backfield, we looked at each other and was like, "Yeah, is this a mistake? Like, I, we didn't think they were going to snap it. I didn't know what the plan was. Yeah, I'd rather take a knee or just have Art fall forward uh, and, and take, take the field goal at that point if, if that's the way you're going to play it. Yeah, that, that didn't make a lot of sense. There was another, you know, try to go kind of – a fake and go heavy screen, like reverse the other way. Just felt like you're right, like trying to hit. And I thought he wasn't his bag early with Tommy DeVito. I, I do wonder, Jeremy, and I'm not trying to let Barry off the hook. There were some plays that just didn't make any sense. 
what's that look like if Tommy DeVito's out there, yeah. right? Like, I, I think we, we just have to acknowledge that the guy that's really been championing this offense and, and being at the helm of it wasn't out there. But it, it, the response, I thought, left a lot to be desired in, in how they called plays with Art Sikowski. But that's – Art Sikowski, this guy's done this a couple of times. He said he's looking back to Rutgers. I, I've gone, gone in there and – and, and had to come in off the bench a little bit. And he's, hey, you've said it a million times. Good good backup quarterback. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, with Minnesota coming to town, you, you would hope. Tommy, I do want to touch Jeremy real quick. You and I did watch. We watched Tommy DeVito, all of those movies. He was in the tent for, by our count, about 20 minutes, which is interesting, right? I thought it was interesting. It almost felt like they were trying to piece them together to get them back out there. Yeah, we were joking about it. They can put a cyborg ankle together, yeah. or a cyborg leg together while they're in there. But I, I thought that was really telling. That was a long, like, we don't see 20 minutes in the medical tent very often. Then he came out walking gingerly, got on the bike, and I don't think we saw him on the sidelines for the second half. Uh, so we'll see. We'll, I mean, that's, that's obviously the biggest story going into Minnesota. Yeah. But I, I think you need him to beat Minnesota. I really yeah, do. Right. Uh, if unless your defense can can hold Minnesota to fourteen points, and you, and you find a way with a week with Sikowski, uh to to figure this out, the good news is, I mean, Brett said it's not catastrophic. You do have a bye week, uh, off week after Minnesota to potentially get him healthy for the next game. But yeah, I mean, that's going to be the big storyline. Brett didn't have really details after this, but the fact that he was moving around, he was on the bike, suggests he could be back shortly i don't know how shortly it would be but that that's all we know at this point but man you're gonna need tommy devito to make an actual run at this because he's really good i mean he's really good and you saw how valuable he is tonight especially watching both these quarterbacks art and spencer petrus i think you see how dynamic tommy devito can be you saw it on the first drive it stalled out but i thought that first drive with tommy devito in there was kind of a tone setter they moved the ball that was 17 plays and they moved the ball with relative ease, he picked up a couple fourth downs with his feet. Uh, I just thought that was – And some people might complain about that end of the drive for Lonnie, right? When, once you get in the red zone. Red zone is really hard once you get inside the 10, right? Like those, those are really hard to, to, to execute in the play because the field is so short. But he had three straight incompletions, right, when, when you, once you got to the nine. And when you have a guy like Chase Brown, listen, they're all, they're, they're all keying on him, but uh, that could be another thing you look at. But, yeah, I mean, Tommy DeVito is really freaking good, but – I mean, Chase Brown, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm out, I'm out of words, man. 146 yards and 31 carries. Should have had more touches than that probably at some point tonight. You can't wait till Josh McCray comes back. And he went through warm-ups today. That was a little gamesmanship, I think, with, with Brett Bielema. I don't think he was ever going to play. But maybe he could be back next week. And if Art has to go to have another running back, uh, they can carry the load. But uh, I don't know what Marshall's running back's doing, but among Power 5 court, uh, running backs, Chase Brown remains the leader. I think it's 870 plus yards. He's on pace to, to, to break the single season record. The fact that that guy is still running for 120 plus yards every week against teams like Wisconsin and Iowa. I mean, he continues to put himself at the forefront along with Blake Corum, Mo Ibrahim. I think the big 10 has the best running backs in the country. He's putting himself in, in that category of Doak Walker guys. And, and maybe a guy who can get a Heisman vote or two. I mean, that's a long way to go, but He's having one of the best seasons in the only running backs ever had. It's really – and we talked about it. Like, at some point, you would think this has got to hit a wall, right? And we talked after the Chattanooga game, like, oh, he's not going to keep this 100-yard deal at Madison and Seven. against Iowa. It's a lot. And it doesn't – you're right. Like, it, there's one game, Indiana, it's like, oh, boy, they're really – geez, they should probably give him a rest. But it hasn't – just hasn't felt, I guess. Like, 31 carries is a good amount of carries. But it just doesn't feel – tonight a little bit it felt force-fed, but it doesn't really feel force-fed. It's just kind of within the flow of the offense. And I think, obviously, if you're Brett Bielema, that's an attractive recruiting pitch uh, moving forward. But, dude, he's really – his the, his cutting ability just to make people miss, it's it's an, it's really something to watch. I do want to touch real quick a couple more injuries. Isaiah Williams, Taz Nicholson, Brett Bielema said concussions. We'll see what that means moving forward. but Yeah, not a good pick-to-click night for Isaiah Williams. Three catches, minus seven yards, three fumbles, two loss. Just got to get rid of that one. right? Like that, that was an ugly game. Ryan Hightower, man, five catches, 68 yards. He continues to just be solidly productive, multiple receptions in every game. I thought the offensive line was very good tonight. I can't wait to watch some of the film. I thought Pilstrom and Chrysler – continue to play better and better and better uh, as the season goes along. So kudos to those guys. But we got to talk about this defense. Th this defensive line, Joey, 
is the best I've seen at Illinois since I've covered them in the 11, 12 years that I've covered them. Johnny Newton, a man child again today, two and a half tackles for loss. Keith Randolph, good pick to click for you. Uh, when he had two back to back tackles for loss, had a sack as well. Uh, the Calvin was pretty good. But man, Seth Coleman had his best performances in Illini. Four quarterback hurries, two sacks, had that big pass breakup to, to get Matthew Bailey the interception towards the end of the game. And I thought Sidney Brown might have had his best game. I know Sam Laporta went off a little bit. He's really good. Nine catches for 100 yards. Spencer Peters kept going to him, but I thought Sydney really battled him, had some big uh, pass breakups and some real good things in, in run support. So, But that defensive front is, is unlike, I think, anything we've seen. At the end of the game, Illinois had 11 tackles for loss, five sacks, uh, six quarterback hurries, and eight pass breakups in this game to go along with the, the late takeaway by the freshman. That seems good. Ugh. So comparatively, Iowa – which traditionally has some guys up front, zero quarterback sacks, six tackles for a loss. Yeah. Illinois, Illinois also 1.7 yards per rush, 52 rushing yards for Iowa, and most of that came on one series. Yeah, and really I think you know, 21 yards, I mean, some of this is just on, on, on a couple plays, really. I didn't even see that set. 200 rushing yards for Illinois to 52 for Iowa. When did we ever think that was going to happen? So in two games, the last two games, <laughs> Illinois allowed 54 rushing yards against Iowa and Wisconsin. Yeah, what is it, 350 to 52, 54 in rushing the last two games to Wisconsin and Iowa? <laughs> Think about, they are owning the trenches, both sides of the ball. That's Bielema ball. That's what you signed up for, and that's what these programs have been so good at. That's why tonight, man, is on top of Wisconsin to win like that, the way you did. That's how Iowa beats other teams. You beat them at their own game. Like, Tariq Barnes even told us that, right? Like, we beat them at their game. Um, man, that's another big feather in the cap for this program. It is. And again, I think to me the biggest point is those last season you lost that game against Purdue, which this kind of did feel a little bit Purdue set up. Didn't they? Like, oh, God, that is going to be the time. I think you lost that game in a different fashion, a little more scoring against Maryland. I'm, I'm missing one, aren't I? Those are the two. Well, I mean, ones. Penn State and Minnesota, you won like one, that. Yeah. Uh, you're just doing it more consistently now, right? Like you're doing it more consistently. You're you know, blowing out some of these teams that are worse than you. So, um, yeah, I think they're starting to string these together more than they did last year, right? Yeah, and, and Treat Barnes, when he was talking about this defense, which, I mean, come on, that's why Illinois won today. It's a defense and, and a retro freshman walk-on kicker. He, like, I wrote about it last week, just hearing the confidence. But when you talk to the defensive guys, dude, it's – but it's not, it's not arrogance, right? Like, but they just so much buy in – to Brett Bielema, to Ryan Walters, to their position coaches. And they they're just on like they just yeah. feel it. They're on. They they're they're loving this touchdown list, home streak. It's really you just feel it. And these guys, that's the larger point, Jeremy, is when we talked about this before we came on, they are all in on Brett Bielema. Yeah. They are all in. I mean, I they believe. They, they believe in his what do we what do we do last week? We we hit the believe <laughs> sign, Ted Lasso style. That's what they that's what they got right now. And you know, I maybe forty four thousand fans weren't entertained every play, but it was a close game. And you, you beat Iowa. Yeah, you haven't beat Iowa in, since two thousand eight. You're just coming off a of Wisconsin win. I think the forty four thousand in attendance, and even if you're at home, starting to believe in them. I, maybe if they don't have Devito next week, it's going to be hard to beat Minnesota. But why not with this defense? With this coaching staff, the way they prepare for him, I mean, why not? Is what's the status of QB one? Yeah, uh, that's, my, that's my biggest question. If Tommy DeVito is help, if if Tommy DeVito can play next week, why wouldn't you pick this team to to beat Minnesota with the way this defense is playing? Like, and, and we've talked about it, and we've talked about it largely with Illinois, but even on the defense, you think this is it? We we know they're good, right? But we. I, I can always, we use Brad Underwood's phrase with them now? Can elite, we please? They are elite. they are elite. They are an elite defense. Now, maybe you put them against against Ohio State, an elite offense beats an elite defense. But um, for this conference and this division, they are an elite defense. They are, but and that's the thing. It's now it's like retraining your mind. You've retrained your mind that Illinois has a good defense, right? And like right now, when when you watch this, you're almost retraining your mind that their defense is at that level at least to the point they're at now. And that's what still feels yeah. a little weird. And I know it sounds like a broken record, but we don't see this, Jeremy. 
it, it took every it took everything in my power. Tariq was a really good interview. You and I got a chance to talk to him one on one a little bit. It took everything in my power to be like it's a little different than nineteen, huh, man? <laughs> but you know, and, and you know, he wasn't going to answer. Dude, but it, dude, it is different. Paucho, after the game, I'm watching him. He's looking at the crowd. I think he found somebody in his family. He's tearing up. He's tearing up because of everything he's been through, everything his program's been through, the, everything he's poured into it, and he's starting to see this. It's it's awesome to see, man. The, the quote, I'm not going to say who it was because it wasn't a press conference quote. It was an off-the-field quote. I went, one of the Illinois defensive players ran off the field and said, we effing know what we're doing. Yes. And that was the most yeah. like, oh, okay. <laughs> that told me everything. And the, the gentleman was very excited yes. about the win, but – they do. They're, they know what they're doing, and they're doing it at a high level. Uh, Tom made a great point. I, I, I wanted to mention this. Hugh Robertson was awesome today. He was. I, I mean, in a game against one of the best punters in the country, and Tory Taylor, who's as good as Blake Hayes, might be better than Blake Hayes, uh, Hugh Robertson was fantastic. He had uh, more yards per punt. The net was better, I believe, for Illinois today. And four punts downed inside the 20. He had a couple – that our boy Lauren Tate liked to, to call coffin corner kicks. He was phenomenal. I, in, a, in a game of field position, in a game with an offense that you knew couldn't take the ball 90 yards and score, uh, Hugh Robertson was awesome. So you know, outside of Isaiah Williams, the, the, the muff punts there, Joey, I, I thought the special teams today was really good considering you had Fabrizio Pinzone out there and then – um, Hugh Robertson, who had really struggled, that was by far his best game as the Illini punter. Yeah, that was a huge game from him. I think it was twice. Is that right? Twice inside the five he pinned them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are – when you got an offense that, I mean, like really, really can't do anything, that, that's huge for, for him to come up like that, especially with some of the ups and downs. What And at one point, wasn't his main competition for the punter job, Fabrizio Pintone? Yes. I mean, that, what a what a circle there. That's – that's a heck of a, a special team's performance, short of the, the muff punt. Yeah. Uh, before we get to your questions and send them in, we love to get interaction from you guys, whatever you want to talk about. We'll, we'll spend the last 10, 15 minutes on that. But, okay, we said win one of these three. You feel solid. Like the bowl game is attainable. Well, now you've won the first two. Uh, don't know if Tommy DeVito will be back, and I'm going to get out in front. We will let you guys know when we know. Uh, if, if you keep asking, we know Tommy DeVito's playing. Well, if we know that, we'll we'll tweet it out. We'll, we'll write a story about it. Generally speaking, <laughs> from this point that we're we're talking to each other now until we talk to Brett Beal on Monday, we don't know. No, uh, unless Tommy DeVito gets on Twitter and says, "See you at Memorial Stadium when I'm playing against Minnesota," we're not going to know. But not trying to be rude, but we save you guys some questions. We're not going to hear any update until Monday at the earliest. All right, what do you expect uh, Beal to tell us Monday? Uh, well, he came in. He's getting treatment. We'll see later on in the week. Something like he's that. running on land or something. I don't know. I, I don't know. And, and you know Sinking what? Sinking spirits. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. And it's going to be frustrating for us who want answers and fans who want answers. He shouldn't answer. He shouldn't answer this week. It this is. is like the – sorry, PJ. We're not going to let you know. Like, if he can go, this kind of shroud or cloud of, of confusion is, is could really work in his favor. Yeah. If he can't go, it's not really going to work in his favor. Brett Bielema would rather he, – he's okay with you guys stressing about whether Tommy DeVito will play next week. Because he knows Joe Rossi is going to stress about whether Tommy DeVito and that's the Minnesota defense coordinator is pretty good at his job. He's like he'd rather have that too. Like he'd rather Joe Rossi and the entire Illini fan base stress about it and and get all the questions from us about it. Uh, but he's not going to give us an answer, and I, that would make sense if he does. In the same way that I would be stunned if PJ Flight gave an answer on Mo Ibrahim. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just look, I, I get it. It's frustrating. We want to get these answers because it makes our job easier. I know you guys want to know. But there is no benefit to telling us. Like, that's just the unfortunate truth of it. There is no benefit for that coaching staff to, to update, in truth, anyone on injuries. The only reason Brett Bielma said anything before Wisconsin about Josh McCray is pretty obvious. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no reason to share that if you're them. Yeah. So, all right, Minnesota, I think it's – I was telling a fan that was walking out of the game, um, he was asking me about next week and how to match up. And I think if Tommy DeVito is healthy, I think it's two teams looking in a mirror. At each other. I think Illinois and Minnesota are the most well-rounded teams in the Big Ten West because they can throw the ball a little bit with Tanner Morgan. He's not perfect, but Mo Ibrahim and Chase Brown are two of the best running backs in the country. I Ibrahim is a beast, uh, just a beast. Uh, but he didn't miss last game, and they weren't the same team. It's just like if Illinois was without Chase Brown, they're a different kind of team. I think Illinois' wide receivers might be better. I think Illinois' offensive line is, is pretty good, so is, is Minnesota's. 
but their defense is, is playing at a really high level. I think they're top five in the country in scoring defense as well. They haven't played a lot of people. Um, Purdue certainly gave them some issues, and, and Purdue had a hard-fought win, and, and Purdue's playing really well. I think it's a, a three-team race right now uh, in, in the Big Ten How West. How dare you sleep on Nebraska? I'm going to still sleep on Nebraska because I'm sleeping You've on never Rutgers. never woken up in Nebraska. <laughs> sleeping on Rutgers. They, they, they lost to Northwestern, man. Northwestern is, is just atrocious at this point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Tommy DeVito is going to determine whether I decide to pick this team or not. Like, I would pick them to win if I think Tommy DeVito is healthy, but I don't know if we'll know that. But um, it's two really good balanced teams. And if Tommy DeVito is hurt, I think it's going to be tough for Illinois to win because I think Minnesota's offense is certainly better than Iowa. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that's, that's the key, right? And you, you certainly, it feels not long ago that we said if they got one of these three and now there's a real, you're a Tommy DeVito availability away from, from probably feeling pretty good about getting, like they, if you, if you beat Minnesota, it's you and Purdue. Like you have separated yourself. I mean, Minnesota would have two losses. Now a lot of things can happen. You got Michigan on the schedule, all that. Nebraska can be plucky maybe, but you set yourself up to where you really control your own destiny. Uh, if you beat Minnesota because you have a game on them, a game on Iowa, all of that, uh, and then you're setting up a huge matchup with Purdue uh, a couple of weeks from then. So you beat Minnesota, man, all of a sudden, like we're already talking about Big Ten West race. Illinois in it. Bowl game, going to happen. Like bowl game's definitely going to happen. Now it's about what bowl game can you attain? Can you get to the Big Ten West championship? You beat Minnesota. You're the front runner. You, it's you and Purdue as the front runners. Yeah, you're. I, I guess I didn't think about that. A bowl game, like we had always talked. Like you get uh, a bowl game, like you, you, I mean, yeah, seven. If you lose to like Northwestern, it's such a winnable game. Like you can be Illinois gonna be in a bowl game, and that's this is also something I was. Ta- I don't remember who I was talking to before the game, uh, but it's almost timed up perfectly for Illinois that like the rest of the West is just kind of dazed and bad and, and and there's coaches getting let go and there's offenses that stink and here's Illinois just kind of slowly like the, the come up for Illinois has really timed up perfectly yeah. with some of these less than I guess traditional years for yeah. these other Big Ten West teams and that's it's fascinating to watch and Brett Bielma's second season Jeremy yeah uh, they are taking advantage of the opportunity in front of them but they're also getting better as you said well, a lot of these other teams are getting worse. I mean, Minnesota, Purdue have the kind of the same opportunity uh, that is in front of them because Iowa's gotten worse, Wisconsin's gotten worse, Northwestern and Nebraska. Nebraska's just always been getting worse, it seems like. But Northwestern, I want to bring this up. Northwestern, I don't know if they're going to win another Big Ten game, right? That would be three out of four years they've won one Big Ten game. Like, that's a trend. That, that's, a, that's a concerning trend uh, for Northwestern. But, um, well, that's a huge opportunity for Illinois to, to keep that trophy – eventually when it comes, because they could be playing for a pretty dang good bowl game and playing for a lot uh, here in late November. All right, uh, let's get to some of these. Uh, Rudy, Art is the worst quarterback I've ever seen. Listen, I don't think Art Sikowski is a great starting Big Ten quarterback. Uh, I I like his demeanor, man. Uh, I I think he's really respecting the team. But, yeah, his decision-making has to get better. Um, But, man, if if you think he's the worst quarterback you've seen, you haven't been watching Illinois football a lot. (laughs) <laughs> the last, 2017 man you don't gotta go far back look at the 2017 quarterback performances it was uh pretty awful but yeah if, you, if you're going with art for multiple weeks don't feel good about winning right? no. and i get it look in 2017 it didn't really matter who the quarterback was because the rest of the team what was either freshman or not very good now there's a, a little bit more of a spotlight on that situation uh, Roger said, will Pat Bryant return next week? He was playing today. Yeah, unless he left with an injury, to which I didn't see. Uh, yeah, he, I don't see the issue. Uh, Bailey, Scott said, is the kind of uh, Quad Cities product that ends up walking on at Iowa and having a productive career. Great find. He brought that up. He said this game meant a lot to him. Iowa recruited him looking for, as a walk-on. They wanted Matt Bailey. So to get him here, uh, boy, he he was a great find. Uh, it was a great job by Pat Ryan. Uh, especially uh, the director of high school relations, longtime Metamora coach, to to really keep on Matt Bailey, watch his film. The recruiting guys obviously loved him as the season went along because he didn't have a good workout here. I think we've told that story uh, in June. They, they wanted to get him on campus because they really liked him. Didn't have a good workout, but they kept with it and uh, certainly paid off. Like Those are the kind of guys that you see from Wisconsin. You see from Iowa. Like, they, they get a lot of three-star kids that really develop uh, into really good players. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really a sexy signing. 
on signing day, uh, but it's really paid out pretty big. Steven, is Larry ready to play or is he redshirt? No, he's a freshman. You don't want that. He's, he's, a, he's a freshman that got here in June. He's the fourth quarterback right now. Ryan Johnson, who's a walk-on, he's a veteran. He played the D2 level. Uh, he is your number three quarterback. So Donovan Leary is not going to play a factor uh, in this unless we haven't seen something, but Ryan Johnson is still taking the third string reps from what I've seen so far. Yeah, you, you don't want to put a true freshman quarterback out there in a season. We just said you're going to a bowl game, right? Like You don't want to put a true freshman quarterback out there on a team that doesn't need to play one. Uh, Eric said, I love seeing a great portion of the basketball team there tonight. Saw the entire wrestling team yeah. uh, here tonight too. It was a great crowd, man. Like I, I know we can argue about – attendance, what it should be, who's a fan, who's not. I'm not going to get into that. Listen, Illinois football has been bad for 10 years. It's going to take a long time to build the fan the fan base back up and, and to get these fans back in the stadium. But 44,000 was the most since 2016. They had to sell it against North Carolina, but they also had 47,000 uh, against Michigan State, uh, which they won that game. Uh, I think that was the homecoming game. I think next week is a real good chance to top 50,000. It's 11 a.m. kickoff. I know it's early, but you can make a day of it. Everybody can get home at a decent hour. But, Joey, I think you've now won back-to-back -back games. It's easier to buy into this thing. It's homecoming next week. I know some of my buddies are coming down uh, that went to U of I and went to my fraternity house. Like They're starting to come down for this game. I, I, think, I think you're going to see uh, an uptick in attendance for that game. I think you'll continue to see – games in the 40,000s this year. And then if you get a really good season, Joey, like after the 2007 season, they went to the Rose Bowl. The next year, they saw a huge uptick in attendance and had multiple sellouts. Yeah, someone made a good – one, uh, I thought the crowd today was pretty pretty awesome, pretty good. The students have been awesome. Like the students are bringing – and they have the entire Brett Bielema tenure here. Yeah, they, and could it have been more? Yeah, right? Like I understand. I'm glad – God, I hope the ticket discussion is behind us uh, at this point. But I thought there was also someone who brought up an interesting point to me. When the season ticket base dwindles down, now you're starting to have to sell more single game tickets. Like this, you want to find a balance there, right? Where you're not asking 35, 40,000 people to to make plans on on kind of a dime or two weeks' notice or whatever the case may be. So what is it 20,000 season tickets? Yeah, or something you like got to find the middle ground there and and this is it like this is a season if you're brad bielman that you can really after the year start to hit this thing home and, and try to get some more of those uh scotty is illinois defensive line better than michigan's i haven't watched a ton of michigan um i don't think michigan i mean they lost so much right two guys that went top 45 in the draft off that edge um michigan's really talented of course but i think illinois got two for certain draft picks Keith and Johnny, are they playing themselves into day two guys? Like they're, they're ridiculous. And, and then if you want to put, cause it's really a five man front, right? You want to put Seth Coleman and Gabe Ackes in there. They can compete with those guys. They're one of the best defensive lines in the big 10. I don't, I haven't watched enough of Ohio state and Michigan. They're certainly really, really good, but I think Illinois defensive line is better than Iowa's defensive line. Yeah. And yeah. I was as good. I was really good. Been a little bit. It's been able to say that. Uh, Steven, Lonnie's good to get himself fired and return it. Breathe, brother. Breathe. Yeah. <laughs> I get like those were frustrating plays. I yeah. get it. We'll ask him about it on Monday. We don't get to talk to Barry on Saturday. And I'm interested to hear what his answer is. But those, I get it. Those were very frustrating. But take a breath. It's, it'll be okay. Dominic said, Beatty and Bailey, two true freshmen making big plays tonight. Don't put Gabe Backus out uh, mm -hmm. of that conversation as well. So to have those guys. Eric, we would have loved to have had McCray tonight. I think you just like to have McCray to, to have another battering ram kind of player, which you don't have right now. Um, really second and goal. I think Barry would have really liked to have him uh, in, in the red zone because uh, he's different than Chase. Chase isn't going to plow through a lot of people. Chase can break some arm tackles, but he's going to push a pile. Probably not. Josh McCray uh, can do that, but just to take some of the load off of uh, Chase Brown, who continues to carry it. And man, he's I don't want to say anything about his health, but he's healthy. <laughs> you know, I, I will say, like, yeah, you, you want McCray there. I have been pretty impressed with Reggie Love. And, and just in some Somebody of these moments that he's had, and it's not been a lot. He had four, three yeah. carries today. One was that one. He probably must have run 40 yards, but he, he, it was a 10-yard gain. He's just made some some kind of big, just get a couple yard plays w without Chase Brown and to get him a breather. I thought he's been – a little overlooked. I get his stats aren't great, but he's had some pretty solid carries. Yeah, this guy's going to end the season with a couple hundred yards. Uh, Tom, three turnovers, three Iowa points. Thank you, defense. Yeah, man. Uh, as, as Brett Bielma said, they're called the fire department. They put out fires. 
Uh, at the end of the day, uh, Cement Mason says, uh, where Illini were at, it's all positive. Five and one should be undefeated. Yeah, they outplayed their opponents in six straight games. Um, they shot themselves in the foot, and they almost shot themselves in the foot too many times today, but find out a, a way uh, to, to get a win. So uh, we'll go through a couple more here. But, but, Joey, I mean, just recapping, Iowa ran for 52 yards against Illinois. Their quarterback got sacked five times. They had 11 tackles for loss, eight pass breakups. And Chase Brown runs for 146 yards. And they win without Tommy DeVito uh, in, in a game where their quarterback play certainly hurt. And uh, three takeaways, uh, three turnovers for Illinois. I think that's a pretty big deal. What – and we kind of talked about this a little bit as this game was unfolding. What would your thought have been had they lost this game? A missed opportunity. Uh, I wouldn't have thought – I mean, we would have talked a lot more about Lonnie. We already did. Um it would have been more under the microscope, but to, to win this game the way you did, uh, you can take a lot of lessons about it. And it's a lot easier to take those lessons. It just would have been a missed opportunity because you'd be one and two in the Big Ten, and you had a chance to beat a team that I think you're better than, uh, and you missed a chance to to break another streak. And I think what this did, even though it wasn't pretty, it continues the momentum, Joey. Continues people talking about Illinois. Haven't brought this up yet. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Will they be ranked? I don't know. There are a couple teams in the back end of the top 25, Kansas, some other teams. Uh, BYU uh, ended up losing. Is this impressive enough of a win? I don't know for some voters, but they're 5-1. They beat Wisconsin and Iowa. They're atop the Big Ten standings. I think they're going to be close. I think they're going to be top 28. Will they be top 25? But to be in that mix, to win it again, I mean, they had some big recruits here, especially in the class of 2024. Jair Hill was here. They had another kid uh, committed to another Big Ten program here that you can check out on the site. Uh, and they had an official visitor, Isavian Miller, who's a, a JUCO kid, uh, currently committed to Ole Miss. Have those guys in the stands for a 5-1 and one team. Like talking to Eddie Turk, uh, who's a, who's a four-star prospect, Lions Township, defensive lineman. He's the kind of guy that's always gone to Iowa, always gone to Wisconsin. He was at the Wisconsin game last week. He was now at the Iowa-Illinois game. This week, his dad went to Illinois. His sister goes to Illinois. Like to have those guys here to witness this crowd, to witness the momentum building. I think that's why this is so big. You continue to build on it. You continue to build the good vibes at Illinois. Uh, it's going in the right direction, and I, I think you'd rather draw it up where you keep winning those games, and, and then maybe lose to Minnesota. Like I'd rather have these back-to-back -back wins to kind of build that buzz going into Minnesota. Yeah, and, and you had a good crowd that these guys. I mean. We've seen recruits come here. Crowds have been really lackluster. And I think it all, Rebbe Lima said it earlier this week, it all ties together. I mean, none, none of this is independent of one another. But I think the most important thing in college football is momentum. Mm -hmm. And it sounds so stupid and so, like, elementary to say, but you want to keep people talking about you as long as people will talk about you. Because if you're on the ticker on ESPN, if you're, if you're in the top 25, if you're being talked about here, like, that's how you're going to get – just more eyes on your program and four straight wins, two Big Ten wins, Iowa, Wisconsin. That will keep the conversation moving. Uh, Lucas said Matt Bailey with a game winning pick, Seth Coleman with the game winning pressure and, and pass breakup uh, as well. Uh, Jake said Jeremy, a college game day trying to get schools. It's never been. What are the odds they're in Champaign next week? I think they have to be ranked. I think they'd like to push. Uh, I, I think, yeah. but and I think it would have helped if Minnesota wouldn't have been off this week. If Minnesota would beat Purdue, if you had a top twenty-five matchup between Minnesota and Illinois, yeah, because you got that Kansas thing, and and they would have loved Brett Bielma. Like, like Brett Bielma's a good national story. He's good quote, like all those things. He would have rolled out the red carpet. Yeah, so I I, I think could have had that. I don't think they'll be the pick next week unless. Illinois was definitely ranked, but if Minnesota would beat Purdue, I think that would have been easier to sell. Yeah, and like I said, it doesn't help. That I, I don't think it helps that Minnesota was off this week, and it's kind of you, you want the the hot iron on both sides, right? I don't. I, I see where it'd be a conversation. It's just hard to hard to see though. Steve asks, "What do you think of Isaiah Williams not having the season I envisioned with the new offense?" One, I think there are other options that they can go to. He does have two 100 yard games. I, I don't want to overlook that. Like I still think he's a really good player, but yeah, I mean. I think tonight was a really bad night for him. Otherwise, I think defenses know to, what to key on with him. I'd like to see him be stretched vertically a little bit. I mentioned it last week. I think there's a chance to do a double move with Isaiah Williams, get him going vertically a little bit more. 
tonight wasn't the night that they were going to get vertically when, when Art Sikowski came in the game. But kudos to him. He did make two big downfield throws. You mentioned the high tower one that the one to Jonah Morris was a hell of a catch uh, by Jonah as well. Yeah, it was. And I get it. Like we talked, I think we talked about it on the pod, the pick when you pick the click, it's been kind of big game, quieter game, big game. I, the thing that I just stay with is the targets are there. Yeah. Like that, that's the thing. That's why you think that at some point he's going to, he might break to have some of those big games. But I think, remember he's, you're into this receiver gig here. Uh, but, yeah, I, I get it. He, he's a good player. Uh, Court, halfway through the season, who is your defensive That's MVP? That's a good question. I'm going to let you answer first. Um, I hate doing this because I, I think they're so individualized. It's It's got to come down to Johnny Newton and Keith Randolph. It, it's it's one of those guys because they're just game wreckers. They're, they're just absolute game wreckers, and everything they do makes the secondary's job so much easier. Like when they don't get pressure – Spencer Petras can sit there and wait until Sam Laporta gets open. Like at some point when you play man-to-man -man coverage, these guys get open because they're good. And, and you can't just stay on somebody for five seconds. Uh, but I would probably oh, – how do you pick between those two? Yeah, you don't. I, mean, I don't think you can. I, I would give them co-MVPs. And I hate doing it because of the law firm thing. They just kind of always get mentioned together. But part of the reason they're so good is because you have to – single block one of them and that that just gives one of them uh, and seth coleman mentioned it today to us I, he was asked like why he's he's playing better he goes well one what seth and or what those guys are doing on the defensive line like i'm in one-on-one -on -one all the time all the time so if he wins he's gonna probably get a pressure or a sack you know what our worst all take exposed might be is when we talked before the season, we said, listen, keith randolph and johnny newton might not have the counting stats because oh. of the position that was the worst take We've had some real crappers. But that was that was a pretty bad take, man. We got some good takes every once in a while, too. Um, do you give it to Johnny just because the pressures? Yeah. Uh, Keith's got a couple more sacks, I believe. The tackles for loss, I think Johnny has a few more. But I think they're still leading the team in tackles. <laughs> the two <laughs> defensive linemen on this team. So that would be my pick. Uh, obviously, Chase Brown would be the guy offensively. Uh, outside of those guys – Seth Coleman had a monster game. I don't want to overlook it. Four quarterback hurries, two sacks. One you know, game, engulfing of uh, Spencer Petras. I mean, he just – it's that was took, they engulfed him. I don't know a better word. Gabe Ackes is really good. Um, Seth Coleman's put together like four weeks in a row here where he's been – like it wouldn't shock me, Joe, if he ends the season with like nine or ten sacks. Yeah. He, he's playing at a really high level right now. Yeah, and it, it, credit to him because it was a rough – Get go here early on in that Wyoming game, and against a little bit early on against Indiana. But man, they've those outside linebackers have put it together. Uh, somebody said Spoon. Listen, Devin yeah, Witherspoon's yeah. awesome. He'll, he'll get paid, so don't don't worry about us not <laughs> mentioning Spoon. Uh, Chase Brown is a level above LaShore and on par with Rashard. I'm not going there. Uh, Rashard was a physical freak. Um, was a first round pick. Chase isn't going to be a first round pick. Chase will have a chance at the NFL. Mikel got injured a little bit. Mikel was big. Uh, he had that on Chase, but Chase is uh, more explosive. Hightower needs more looks. Hightower's been good, man. Uh, they're targeting him just enough, in my, my opinion. Uh, Hank Bates should be the punt returner. He's more sure-handed. Um, well, he might get some reps at this point because Isaiah, if it's a concussion, that would put him uh, close there. Barnes, the MVP tonight, he's great. I mean, everybody on the defense had to be great tonight. We, we need to pay Walters $2 million. Uh, He's getting the raise. So, Brett Bielma's getting a raise. Everybody on the defense is certainly getting a raise. I mean, everybody I – mean, that's good staff. And the defensive staff is is really freaking good, man. But, yeah, Brian Walters and what he's doing, uh, he's going to get a sizable raise, as he should. Brian Walters' agent must be a pretty happy dude. <laughs> his, his client is is getting talked about a lot, and he should be interesting. I I think Illinois could make a pitch just – to make him really, really, really – he already does really, really have to think. He's paid pretty well here. Yeah. But, yeah, if he, if he stays, he's getting he's going to get a raise. And if you can keep him, the sell of Jire Hill, the sell of some of these defensive backs just becomes even easier. So I, th I have no doubt Illinois will pay him. Like, if if he wants to stay here and – Colorado, they want to give an head coach. They need to interview Ryan Walters. Like, Rick George needs to interview Ryan Walters. And if they offer him the job and he gets paid $4 million, like, hard to pass that up. But Brett Bielma, you've heard it, um, say he doesn't need to take the first job, basically. Like, he's got to get the right fit, the right environment. Colorado's kind of a mess. Colorado's a, a job right now that can really 
put a sour taste in other athletic directors' mouths about a first-year head coach. It's going to be tough sledding there. So it's that is so fascinating. What what he's gonna, what opportunities are going to be there, or what what that's going to look like. Uh, Mark said, "I th- would like to think we learned from Indiana loss to this point, finishing a game like this." Trick Barnes talked about that. Yeah, he talked that about good. that exact same exact same thing. It wasn't something they talked about on the field, but it's just kind of just ingrained. I mean, they, they that that was a it was a tough loss, but I think it's one that, as cliche as it sounds, they're not just forgetting about either. Uh, give us a final record for this team. I mean, it depends on Tommy DeVito's health, right? It's, and and that's. It's hard to do, but like right now, back half of this, I mean, four wins. I, I think they're capable of getting four wins the rest of this way, right? I mean, isn't that a decent bar of getting nine and three? You probably have a chance to, that would put you at six and three in the Big Ten, chance to win the Big Ten West, chance to go to the Citrus Bowl, which was here today, chance to go to the Relia Quest Bowl, formerly the Outback Bowl. Um, so R.I.P. Bloomin' Onion. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say, man. We got to get more. We got to get some Bloomin' Onion. Is yeah, that, is that about – I mean, if DeVito can't play next week, I think it's going to be really hard. I think Minnesota's really good. Uh, and I would expect Minnesota to score a touchdown, but I say that and then I start to doubt myself. I think they'll score a touchdown and, and get into the teens at least. Uh, can Illinois score? Like, that's that's my big question. But um, I think Minnesota's going to be a tough matchup. I think you should beat Michigan State. I think you should beat Nebraska. I think you should beat Northwestern. Purdue, Minnesota, toss-ups. Michigan at Michigan is going to be very hard. Now, is Michigan unbeatable? No, but the ceiling, I see people saying 11-1, 10-2. Yeah, sure, that that can be the ceiling. Uh, But my expectation for this team right now, crazy to say, is kind of 9-3. But, like, worst-case scenario, probably 7-5, which is pretty good. (laughs) For Illinois. Seven and five. Yeah, that's that's the floor to me, right? Because you've got Northwestern, which is a total disaster. I mean, you are – I don't think you've made your opinion on Nebraska very clear. Yeah, they're <laughs> bad. They're, they're, they're bad They're bad football. And kudos to Mickey Joseph for winning a couple of games. It's against Indiana. I know Indiana can battle some people, and Illinois lost to them. Um, Indiana's not very good, and Rutgers is terrible. The only reason – Rutgers is going to be 13th. In my Big Ten rankings tomorrow morning, and the only reason is because Northwestern is so putrid. Like Northwestern, I think Illinois is going to beat by four touchdowns. Um, they're they're really bad. I mean, Wisconsin beat them forty-two seven today. Uh, so I I think that's a given win. There's your bowl game. I think Nebraska, Michigan State. Worst case scenario is you split those. And that's the worst case. I, I think you're going to win both those games. Yeah, it's we have to talk about this now, right? I mean, it, it continued to kind of force our hand. To discuss real quick, uh, would Isaiah Williams be used as a quarterback in an emergency situation? I would be incredibly hard pressed to think that's the case. I, I mean, I would no, because you, you're hampering yourself at wide receiver. This is a guy who doesn't take quarterback snaps. You've got other quarterbacks. I mean, I I get it, and I understand, but no. Art Sikowski would be your quarterback. I know, I, I know, I know, I know what you see, but he's the second quarterback, and he's the second quarterback with a bullet. So what they see in practice. And I think we know this coaching staff is pretty smart. I don't think there's some magic bullet. I, I don't think there's some magic bullet to fix it. Most backup quarterbacks are going to struggle. You see what Rutgers, what happens with them so far this year. And that that's a problem for a lot of programs outside of Michigan, outside of Ohio State. It's once you get to that second string quarterback, and that's a, that's an area they this staff has to improve. Um, and, and certainly they're probably, they need to go in the transfer portal uh, for a starter after Tommy DeVito. But they need to continue to build better depth at quarterback as they do for most positions. Yeah, and that's it's going to take time with guys like Donovan Leary, Kirkland Michaud. They've got Cal Swanson was on campus today. Yeah, it's backup quarterbacks are they're hard to find. They're always popular. They're hard to find. Right now, if, if Tommy DeVito can't go, Art Sikowski is going to be the starter. Ryan Johnson's a backup. Beyond him, you probably I, pick a freshman, right? Tommy or Kirkland Michaud. Donovan Leary, probably Kirkland, because I would suspect because Leary was was limited. That's just the reality of it is right now. But Isaiah Williams ain't it. Uh, shout out to the guy who said this would be the drunkest post game pod, and he was here for it. So we appreciate you. I <laughs> hope you guys had a good time. It was a great day. It was it was a great day uh, to, to see everybody uh, to to go through the the tailgate show. It was it was pumped up, and uh, your girl Stella loves you. So Stella, I didn't have any Mountain Dew, but send me Diet Coke. <laughs> Uh, so thank you guys for listening to the Illini Choir podcast. We appreciate all your support. Hopefully these live post-game podcasts you guys really enjoy. So check us out if you don't always. Give us the like uh, button. It always helps us out. 
here on YouTube. And, and if you're not, and you're listening to this post game podcast uh, through the podcast feed. Appreciate you guys giving us a follow at YouTube as well. Uh, and for following us wherever you get your podcast, give us a subscription wherever you do. We got to get to work. It's 1220. It's going to be a late night, but we'll have plenty of post game uh, on the website. We'll have Alvin. I got to talk about this win, like some of the players talking about the grittiness of this and, and what this means for the program was really great. Joey's going to talk about the uh, fire department defense and Fabrizio Pintone, right? I, I keep saying Pintone. I think it's Pinton, but I like Pintone better. A better journalist would have asked him that today when they talked to him. I am not. That, that's, two, that's two strikeouts for me. I didn't get the mullet question to Mayer. I, I didn't ask the, the kid how to How do you not ask Matthew Mayer, Meyer, by the way? Shoot. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew Meyer about the mullet. Cut the podcast now. It's over. <laughs> All right, we'll say goodbye to you guys. Have a great night, everybody. Uh, thank you for listening to the Online Enquirer podcast. Take care of each other, and we'll talk to you next time.